I heard that voice in time. Hallelujah. I'm so glad I heard that voice in time. I'm so glad I heard that voice in time. Oh my Lord, oh my Lord, what shall I do? The scripture this morning is from Mark 1, 9 to 13. It's about the baptism and the temptation of Jesus. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with wild beasts, and angels waited on him. Morning. John works as a valet alongside one of his best friends. They work in San Francisco and they get to valet luxury cars. Sean and Katie have known each other since they were teens. In fact, since Sean first came to America. He came here, even though he seems like a 20-something ambitious man, ambitionless man, he came here to escape the hold of his father, Wen Wu, a powerful leader of an organization called the Ten Rings. Some of you know where I'm going with this, some of you know. Wen Wu made sure that his son was trained as an assassin something that Sean has been trying to escape since he was little. 
And even though he's tried to reject it for as long as possible, his past comes roaring back when a pack of assassins corner he and Katie on their way home on a San Francisco city bus. Now Sean has a choice, what will he do? And as these assassins confront Sean, Katie looks at them and then looks at him and with a stupefied look says, uh, you've got the wrong guy. Does he look like he can fight? <laughs> what ensues is an epic martial arts fight scene. And in fact, one of the best shots is a slow motion scene where Sean is throwing a punch and in the background you can see Katie's face with her mouth gaping open watching a like, slow motion tennis shot. <laughs> because she can't believe her eyes. This person she's grown up with, that she spends every day with, that she works with, she had no idea that he had these kinds of moves. And after the assassins give up or are knocked out, Katie looks at him frustrated and says, who are you? She's faced with the reality, with the possibility that this person she's known for over a decade it's not really who he says he is. And so again, she asks him, stupefied, who are you? Who are you? Eugene first, who are you? I've read the program you prepared. I've talked to your allies. I've read articles about your church. But who are you? Really, some of you are sitting in the pew today or watching the home. That's a really good question. And the rest of you are like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the daughter of Francis and Sharon and John. The grandchild of Carmelita, Bacho, Barbara, Jim, and Daisy. I'm the youngest and I'm the middle child in a blended family. I'm the descendant of immigrants from India, Mexico, and Western Europe who met here on Turtle Island. I'm a musician, a leader, a servant. I am queer and whole and grown. My name is Jessica Shine and I bring you greetings. On behalf of your friends and my colleagues at the National Aesthetic of the United Church of Christ, I'm joined today by my wife, Reshna, our 17-year-old daughter, Kaya, is practicing her social butterfly skills today. <laughs> but she did send me a text just before we came out today. She said, you're coming to break, I know. Just remember to be. <laughs> Something her mom and I tell her often. We are native best coasters transplanted to the Pacific Northwest, all born in California. I kind of wanted to introduce myself to you the way that one of our staff did last week on Zoom. Hi, my name's Jessica. I love chocolate, puppies, long walks on the beach, my favorite color is blue. <laughs> that sounded really fun. Instead, I'll do a speed round. So if you're taking notes, try and keep up with me. I've been playing, writing, and singing music since I was a teenager. I love to cook and eat. I love language, you see, I'm a Giants fan, and I'll keep on believing. <laughs> I've traveled to 15 countries, done something David Beckham failed at, led my own congregation, prepared chaplains for our nation, and have served the church for almost 25 years. I love Jesus, and I love people. I'm delighted to be with you today. And thank you to everyone who made it today possible. Arranging rooms, rearranging Wi-Fi, and planning. If, if you haven't said thank you to those folks, say thank you today. I wanted to share with you today stories of calling, of my call to ministry, and to wrestle with you and where God may be calling you to go. But as I look to the scriptures, to one of my favorite scriptures, I realize that's not actually where I want to start. 
So often in prophetic communities and movement, there's an emphasis on what are we doing next? Where's the next march? What banner do we hang? Where do we give our money to or not? And those are all really good questions. But the truth is, is if we're so much involved in thinking about what we do next, we oftentimes don't have the opportunity to reflect on who we actually are. So in my experience, the prophetic communities and organizations that I've worked with have slowed down to begin to ask them some of those questions to say, who are we? What do we actually believe? And can we come from that place of boundaries so that we not only make an impact in this generation, but for seven generations to come? Who are we called to be? I can think of no better definition of who I am than the text in Mark chapter 1. If you have your Bible with me or your phone, feel free to open it to Mark chapter 1. Thank you, Steve, for sharing that text. According to the author, Jesus has just arrived in Galilee. He shows up, in fact, to be baptized by his cousin John. And in verses 10 and 11, before Jesus is called out to the desert, before he even calls his own disciples, Jesus' identity is established. And I wonder if that's the invitation for us today, too. In verse 10, the text says, As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit ascending on the light of God. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. First, the voice says, You are my Son. In other words, You belong. You're my child. Did you know that research is now telling us that exclusion, the feeling of not belonging, is akin to physical pain? A recent article by the Harvard, Harvard Business Review says that when we feel excluded, when we don't feel like we fit in someplace, it's akin to being poked, to being punched, or to having some physical assault on your body. And you've felt that pain, haven't you? According to the article, 40% of people in the workplace feel like they don't belong. 40%. Imagine what it's like in a spiritual community. Imagine what it's like in your own family. You know that kind of movie. Or maybe you've seen it. Coming out as an adult can be more challenging in any other time in your life because your identity is already established. Coming out in an evangelical family can be down the way of the gospel. And as I think about my childhood, there were so many times when I would have loved to hear from the adults around me, you belong. I was an awkward teenager when I was trying to figure out who I was in my body and in my beliefs and not feeling comfortable outside or inside of me, it would have been so reassuring to have adults in my life say, you belong, you're mine. Belonging matters. And it's interesting that in our country, in the United States, companies spend $8 billion and diversity and inclusion. It's the mark because they neglect our need to feel included. Diversity doesn't equal belonging. To hear you are mine, you belong, is significant. And I wonder if there's someone who needs to do that today. Second, the voice of the divine says, Whom I love. The word there in the Greek is agapetos. It's the same word Jesus uses when he questions Peter. Do you love me? He asked Peter three times. Peter says, of course I do. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. That's the word that's used. It's the word for transcendent love. It's the beloved. What would happen if you began to see yourself as beloved? What would happen if the people that you interact with on a day-to-day basis were told, you're beloved, you're loved. I remember the first time Deshna said, I love you. 
Uh, before you get all mushy, listen, those of you that have been like in relationships for a long time, you're like, oh, this is so big. Everybody else who's been single for a minute is like, oh, boy, this is terrifying. It was terrifying. This woman is beautiful. She's intelligent. She's accomplished. And we had been bantering in our long distance relationship. I was in Berkeley, she was in Portland, and we were talking on the phone. And you know how it is, right? When you like somebody, but you don't want to be the first to say it because you don't want to be vulnerable and you don't want to be embarrassed. And so we were doing all the things that we could to get as close to it as we could. Well, I really, really liked our conversation. But well, I really, really liked talking to you. Well, listen, I gotta let you go now. But listen, I'm gonna tell you, I really like you. Oh, no, 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 but I was like, really like you. Like, I like you so much. It was after one of our dates uh, in Berkeley, and I'll never forget the feeling she whispered in my ear. I love you. It was so terrifying because I thought I was going to explode because there was no way for me to put into words. It didn't seem like I love you could describe what I was feeling for this human being. But before I could get it out of my mouth, she said, <laughs> the prophet Navlana Jalaluddin says it's the meeting of the lover and the love. This is the experience described in the Gospel of Mark when Jesus emerges from the water. The voice of the divine says, you are my love. You're mine. And I love you. What if in this moment of social and political unrest, we're being called not only to do, but to be reminded of who we are? What if we begin or continue our work by being rooted in the truths that we belong and we are the love. In this moment described in Mark, at Jesus' baptism, heaven explodes because God cannot restrain God's self. They must tell everyone who this is. And I wonder if one of the reasons that many folks are reticent of Christianity, even progressive Christianity, is because we've told them believing is more important than beloved. You hear me today, church? What if instead you reminded folks you're beloved? Just to keep on. Just as I am without you. I don't need you to believe that the story in the gospel is true. That's not the point. I need you to know who you are. And this is a great place to start. Third, the voice says, with you, I am well pleased. And I'm kind of a stickler for the Greek language, so I'll be honest with you. I really don't like this translation. <laughs> the word is actually eukeo. It, you know, if, you, if you're lazy about me, you can say you're okay. That's, that's not the same. <laughs> that's that's how people talk in English. <laughs> The Greek word is eudokeo, and it's not actually I'm pleased with you. It's more closely akin or better translated to I am resolved. There is no shifting in how I feel about you. My feelings can't be swayed about you. You can't, you can't act the right way to please me. You can't believe the right things to make me love you. All of heaven has made up its mind about you. That's the experience Jesus is having in this story. And so often in American Christianity, we're given this idea that God is like a friend. You know what a friend is, right? You can't really decide what friends are enemies. It's like the story is one of my favorite stories, but also I kind of feel weird when somebody asked me to go out this way. It's, it's like the story of the two friends who went fishing, right? You've heard this story, two guys go fishing and they get out to the cabin in the woods where they're going to be right by the lake. And as they're getting ready for bed, one of the guys puts his shoes on as he's climbing into the bunk. And the other friend looks at him and says, why are you putting your shoes on? And the first guy says, well, the bear's out here. <laughs> the 
the second guy says, you, you can't outlive there. <laughs> the first guy says, I don't have to outlive there. I just have to outlive you. That's a frenemy. <laughs> Sometimes we treat God that way. Like God is this person up on his throne that at any moment will throw down a lightning bolt to punish us because we haven't done the right thing or said the right thing or fought the right thing or God forbid prayed the right thing. But God is not a friend of me. God is not someone we have to walk on eggshells with. That's how we can sing in our prayer today. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh God creator, there is no shadow of truth. In this text, Jesus is being told that all of heaven has resolved itself and how they feel. So be who you are. If we're made in the image of the divine, how could God not take joy in you? Maybe you're here or watching online and you still have that story, I'm lacking something, something's wrong with me, something must be off of me, I'm broken. Maybe you're still asking, who am I? Let me tell you, you belong. You are loved. All of heaven is resolved in joy because of you. There's a reason the author captures this experience at Jesus baptism. The sky is open. A dove appears and the voice of God is heard. I never have time to unpack all the symbolism here, but in baptism, People would get undressed. Don't worry, I'm not going to illustrate that part for you today. <laughs> I like all the but not that much. Um, <laughs> so, coming to the water, someone would take off their outer robe, their outer cloak. And oftentimes, they might get naked if they're going in, just leave a cloth wrapped around their waist. And in this story, when Mark writes, he writes with intention because he knows the Hebrew readers will understand that the invitation from the divine is one to vulnerability. One to say, you don't have to wear all of that to impress me. Just come as you are. The water symbolizes a place to be washed, to release yourself of the stories and the ideas and the things that no longer serve you. Because when you come up out of that water, you are rising into who you really are. And the Jewish readers would catch all of these nuances. Mark is alluding to the invitation to vulnerability. And I'm wondering what you need to release, what no longer serves you. It's as though the divine is saying in this passage, I see your heart. I love you. I'm resolved in how I feel about you. I'm resolved in my love for you. This is who you are. Can you please remind your siblings every once in a while? I was in seminary at the time visiting family in Birmingham, England, and my uncle insisted that I attend worship with him at their local boudoir. If you don't know what a boudoir is, it is a sick temple of worship. Um, it is also the place where community gathers and where food is prepared and clothes are distributed. It is the all-purpose meeting place for the sick community. And so my uncle insisted that since I'm visiting him and my cousins and my aunts, that I come with them to worship, which was not a problem for me because one of the five tenets of sickism includes giving away free food. <laughs> and one college again does not love free food. Especially really good, like homemade by Auntie's uh, Indian food. So, of course, I go to the Rubara with my family, and after service, we're eating our lunch, and one of the priests is walking by, and my uncle flags him down and says, My niece is here visiting from the United States and studying to be a pastor. And the priest's eyes went up, and I thought, Oh boy, this is going to be interesting. And the priest says, Come with me, I want to, I want to show you the rest of the Rubara. And so we go and we look around the various rooms. That's wonderful. And then we start going upstairs. And I turn around and look at my uncle and this eye is really big. And I'm, I ask myself, well, what, what is it? Is everything okay? And he's like, I've never been up here. 
I've been coming here for decades. I've never been up here. So I, I start thinking, oh boy, this is, this is going to be, this is going to be big. And so we walk upstairs, and if you've ever been into a boudoir, you know there's a special room where the scriptures so This is true. This is, this is sacred text. And they're usually fan uh, and attended to it. So we walk by the room with the point of idea. And we walk into an upper temple that Michael has never seen in his entire time in the United Kingdom. And he's just in awe. You can just tell he's inside. He wants to be like this kid at his first time at Disneyland, but he's also so revered. Uh, it's so much in reverence. He doesn't quite know what to do with himself. And the priest is just showing us things like it's no big deal. Like this is a Tuesday tour, you know? And over here is the altar. Here's where we do this. And here's where we say our prayers. And the room, all I remember is about it is that it was covered in mirrors. And there was a beautiful big window that was letting sunlight in. And the altar had all kinds of small, weird pieces of artwork. And in that moment of hushed reverence, the priest turns to me and says, Are you a Christian? <laughs> and I was terrified. I honestly thought, I don't know. Like, I don't know how to answer this. You know, is this a trick question? And he could tell, like, I was honestly scared. Like, I wasn't really sure what to ask. And my uncle's like, and I said, uh, yes. <laughs> and he, he says, you're a Christian? You follow the teachings of Jesus. Be who you are. If you say you follow the teachings of Jesus, if you say if you're a Christian, be a Christian. If you say you're Muslim, follow the way of peace. Follow the way of Muhammad. If you're Jewish, be Jewish. He said, I'm sick because I follow these teachings. I can't do anything else. So if you're a Christian, be who you are. In this passage, we're told who we are. We belong. We are beloved. All of heaven has resolved itself in joy. Be who you are. Would you stand with me for the benediction? Go forth as God's people to serve those around us. Go forth. Following as best you can in the footsteps of Jesus. We will share with you the praise and love of each other. Go forth as those strengthened by the Spirit of God's love. We will stand with others, serving God. May it be so.